Uh, thank you. Well, uh, as Chairman has explained, I've just come from Bonn where I was attending the memorial Arbeitstagen for Fritz Hitzelburg. And so I had to prepare my talk there very carefully. And I only left a short journey on the train between Bonn and Paris for preparing this talk. So I'm afraid I will be repro reproducing most of that talk with a few additions at the, at the end, uh, which I thought about this morning. Uh, that I met, I heard, first heard about Jean-Michel Bismuth many, many years ago. Uh, one, one of my friends with a colleagues in Oxford as a probabilist said there was this young up-and-coming man in Paris we should watch out for. And then uh, I met him a few years later. Uh, I went to the, the Schwartz Conference in Paris in 1983, he reminds me, and I gave a talk there about Witten's proof of the index theorem with using, fi using the loop space. And uh, he, he, he tells me always that uh, this was the, the date when he changed from being a probabilist to being a differential geometer. It was a sort of influential moment in his, in, his, in his career. And then after that, we invited him to Oxford. He gave some lectures in Oxford. And uh, he, he, yesterday, I was uh, picked up from the railway station by his uh, daughter, Elizabeth, who he tells me started life in Oxford. So it's very appropriate. <laughs> um, now, so the, this talk, as I said, is, is really, to great extent, a repetition of the talk I gave in Bonn, but there's bits at the end which are different, and I'll explain them when I come to it. So this first bit is really a very fast historical review of index theory as it developed through the work of Hertzberg, Grotendieck, and myself, and which subsequently was taken over by the younger generation, and including Jean-Michel, who has made contributions, which is still making contributions today. So this is part of the history of the subject, as we know it. Now, I'm the oldest person here, so my memory goes back a long way, uh, I hope. So um, keep, uh, st you can start, I mean, history never has any be real beginnings, but you can start with the period about 1953 when Hitzbrook was in Princeton, and the theory of churn classes and bunch of Eigen classes was for properly developed in a good formal way. Before that, it had been rather geometrical, very complicated, but uh, Borel and Hitzbrook set it on a, the right formal program, uh, set up in this form, so that the churn classes are viewed as elementary symmetric functions of some two-dimensional variables, xi. And the Pontiagin classes are symmetric functions of the squares of the variables. And these are the people who, I like to show a lot of people's pictures, by the way, because we mustn't forget that mathematics is created by people. And here are people who were involved in the creation of these theories. There is Chern in the middle, the grandfather figure of, after whom Chern classes are named. And then there's Morel and Hitzelbrook who pushed the theory forward in the years after 53. And then there is the, the Todd genus. Um, Todd was my supervisor when I was a student in Cambridge. He was an uh, algebraic geometer of the old school. And actually, he knew what churn classes were in terms of algebraic geometry. He'd, uh, he'd written a paper introducing them, really. Uh, but in particular, he'd worked out these famous Todd polynomials, which uh, he worked out by hand, with using solving 12 by 12 matrices and things. And then Hitzler came along. We wrote down this beautifully simple generating function, <coughs> which everything else followed. And I think Todd wrote to Hitzler at the time saying, he, he has to revise his view of the Princeton School, that they were very good at general theory, but couldn't do calculations. He thought that uh, Hitzelbrook had beaten him at his own game. Uh, now, the two major figures who lay the foundations for this rapid development of algebraic geometry and, uh, after the war were uh, Jean Leray and Henri Cartan from very different points of view. Leray produced spectral sequences and sheaves. Uh, Henri Cartan apply those to complex analysis, and then subsequently through set out to geometry. So those are the two great figures in the history of the, the subject. And then the, the people that followed, uh, when Fritz went to Princeton, he met Kodaira and Spencer, Spencer there on the left, and a very young Sir, I, I hope you recognize him still, <laughs> very, very young Sir, uh, and, and a, quite a young looking Kodaira also, are being given the field medal by Hermann Weil, and I'm intrigued exactly what Hermann Weil was saying. He had his finger in the air. He's obviously saying something important, and I, I should ask Sarah whether he remembers after, after all these years what Hermann Weil was actually saying. 
in there. It's a nice photograph of, of the three of them together. And then, the, besides the Todd genus, which came into algebraic geometry, Hertzberg discovered what he called the L genus. And this is defined in terms of generating function involving x over tangent x, which is very closely related to the generating function for the Todd genus by this simple trigonometric formula. And uh, he, this is introduced by his book in order to get the formula for the signature of a 4K dimensional manifold. And the signature is given by the value of the L polynomial. So in dimension 4, you get one third of the Pontryagin class, and otherwise more complicated formulas involving the Pontryagin class and some complicated numbers. Um, and he did this, and as soon as Thomas' cobordism theory was developed, he immediately got the proof of these formulas. <coughs> And then, because of the relationship between this and this one, he realized that somehow it was not too far away to get to the riemann roch theorem. And after a great tour de force, he succeeded. So the riemann roch theorem, which followed, came through uh, this route indirectly. And here is the riemann roch theorem. In its simplest form, you have a compact, complex manifold, which sort of fits with the algebraic variety, predictive variety, the sheaf of holomorphic functions, the sheaf cohomology groups, the alternating sum, of the dimensions of our, called the arithmetic genus, and the theorem of the book for the trivial sheaf function, not just general bundle, says the Euler characteristic is equal to the Todd genus, the value of the Todd polynomial, and this sim extremely simple formula. This is the, the theorem that made his name and the foundation stone for a great deal of work to follow. And for the case of when n is 1 in the Riemann surface, you recover uh, the formula for the uh, genus of, of a Riemann surface. Uh, the signature formula, as I indicated, is given by a very similar formula. Now you have a real manifold, no complex structure. Its dimension is 4K, it's oriented. It has a quadratic form in the middle dimension, non-degenerate. And you, when you diagonalize the quadratic form, you get P plus signs and Q minus signs. And the difference in the number of signs is called the signature of the quadratic form, called the signature of the manifold. And his theorem said the signature of the manifold is the value of the L polynomial in that dimension. So, the, so these two theorems, which go to very much in parallel, were, were great triumphs of this period and really laid the foundation for a vast amount of what was to follow. Uh, now here is a picture taken of two very professional mountaineers climbing Mont Cat Catapetl in Mexico. You can see <coughs> the snow in the background is a tall mountain. Uh, you can see that it's very cold because they're wearing uh, thick clothes. But if you look carefully, you see that we're not really dressed as mountaineers. We have t jackets and ties and smart shoes and I am afraid to say my wife was somewhere down, down below here in the car taking the photograph of the two mountaineers. But uh, it was a cl classic occasion, Mexico Conference of 1956. We, we drove there and we went a tour one day. And this is 20 years later, showing that we got much younger, I dress much less formally now, <laughs> and uh, outside the institution in Bonn. Now, besides the El genus and the Todd genus, Fritz uh, realized there were very closely related other quantity, which he called the A-roof genus. A the A-roof genus was called A-roof because, first of all, there was the A genus, which differed by some factors of two, and he subsequently realized that it is important to have the factors of two in the right place, and so then you have this uh, e to the minus c1 over 2, and the relationship in the Todd genus is, is the A-roof genus times the e to the minus c1 over 2. So, in other words, the Todd polynomials are polynomials in the Chern classes, but in fact, they only depend on the first Chern class and the Pontryagin classes. And it was clear that this was an important quantity. Uh, Fritz proved theorems about it. it. That factor of one half suggested it has something to do with spin manifolds. And then a few years later, Singer and myself, we proved the interpretation of the roof genus was the index of the Dirac operator on a, on a spin manifold. So this is the sort of third uh, example, fundamental um, index theorems, and it, ca it came uh, a little bit after the other ones. And D was the Dirac operator, and of course this is the beginning, although we didn't know it, of the connection to physics. Physics is over here, you can't see it, and we didn't see it, but we knew that Dirac, Dirac was a physicist. I'd been to Dirac's lectures, uh, and, but we had no idea that this would actually be relevant to physics. Now, in the subsequent years, it's turned out to provide the, one of the bridges that goes between differential geometry of this kind and real theoretical physics. All physicists now know the, about the A-roof genus and the Dirac operator and so on. 
Now, the Bernoulli numbers enter in this game because the function, the generating function for the Todd polynomials uh, is expanded out, its coefficients, except for some factorials, are the same as Bernoulli numbers. There's either there's a half, half, only one, one odd power in this expansion, it's coefficient one half, all the other ones are even coefficients, even powers, so if you relabel them with a big K and a sign, then these are the Bernoulli numbers, these are positive rational numbers, which turned out, as a consequence of Hitzelman's work, to have played a very important role in topology. And this is the first real link between topology and number theory. The ruling numbers of a long history, as you know, in number theory, related to all sorts of beautiful things in number theory, and here they are related to a very important fundamental aspect of algebraic geometry. That's a consequence of Hitzelman's discovering this generating function. And the Bernoulli numbers are everywhere present in modern topology now. And the other thing which uh, emerged in the work of Fritz was uh, Cauchy residues. Uh, well, this is a very simple calculation, but uh, in the course of the Hitzelman Riemann Rock theorem, the theorem says that the Todd genus is equal to the arithmetic genus. If you start with complex vector space, it's rational variety, so the Todd genus is one. So therefore, the, I mean, the arithmetic genus is one. So therefore, the Todd genus has to be one. But the Todd genus is given in terms of the churn classes of the vector space, which is one plus x to the n plus one. So the formula is tells you the Todd genus is the coefficient of x to the n in this expansion. And that has to be one. And you prove it's one by a simple application of the Cauchy residue formula, where you replace the variable x by the variable one minus e to the minus x. Uh, it's a trivial calculation in complex variable theory, but you must remember here, x was meant to be a formal two-dimensional cohomological variable. Even it wasn't even real cohomology, it was some virtual object, and it was a cohomology class. So what were you doing, doing complex analysis on it? Well, it was one of the mysteries and beauties of the story that Fritz exploited, was this link between the complex analysis of x as a complex variable, and x as a formal cohomological indeterminate. And in those days, it was really looked like magic. It still is, in some ways, some kind of magic. And I'll come back to this. So that's the first uh, introduction. Now, the, one of the things that his books um, drew attention to, what, what I labeled, put together here as the notion of uh, defects of singularity. If you've got a Riemannian manifold, or a Hermitian manifold, if it's complex, then the, um, this angle I can't read, I have to read here to get the length. Um, then the proper Pontiagin classes for, for, and turn classes can be represented by differential forms, by the turn they theory, and the theorem of one and two express the arithmetic genus and the signature as integrals over x of these differential forms. Now, if x is a singular set of some, some kind, but it may still be true to, it's possible to define the Euler characteristic and signature, then you can ask for the difference between the integral formula and the topological invariant. And that hits what we call the defect due to the, sing to the singularity. Some singularity would change the formulas. And this would be the amount by which they would be changed. Now, there are several cases where this can happen. First happens if the if x is not a rational, is not a manifold, but a rational homology manifold. It may have, for example, orbifold singularities, which are the kind of singularities you get when you divide a manifold by a finite group. That only affects, the, and the rational cohomology is enough to define the signature. So the signature is defined, but you have singularities, really, because of the presence of these orbifold singularities. And the question is, uh, what is the difference between the integral formula and the signature. And this is the, uh, therefore, still defined in this case, and it's a problem. Second example is if x is a complex algebraic variety, which is singular, uh, some singular sub-variety sigma, but of course the Euler characteristic is defined for all sheaf cohomology groups, not just uh, for non-singular manifolds, so you can still ask for the formula for the arithmetic genus, in terms of the uh, topology, part of it will come from the integral of the Todd class, and some other contribution will come from the singular set. And the question is to work out the formula. The third case, which is in many ways the simplest, if x is still a manifold, but the metric has singularities along some set sigma. So these are, of course, overlap these things, but they are really different kinds of problems in different areas. This is in, uh, well, rational homology, and this is an algebraic geometry, and this is an differential geometry. Now, I picked up some more photographs here to keep you happy. These are two young men 
well, they were both young men at the time. Uh, one of them got a bit older since. Uh, that's Don Zage, trying very hard to look his age. He's, he still looks to me. I knew him when he was 18. To me, he's still 18-year-old with a beard. Uh, and this is Potodi, a very brilliant young Indian mathematician who tragically died very young. He had a career somewhat like that of Ramanujan. He came, he was self-taught, he was marvelous with formulae, and he died exactly the same age as Ramanujan. But before that, he got, he'd made contact with Bok and me and Singer, and we wrote papers together, uh, which have been very influential. And you know, these are two young men who appear in the next bit of the story. So the special cases of the example I gave before was uh, in the cases of the orbital singularities, if you have a manifold divided by a finite group, by a finite group, equivariant version of the index theorem gives you formulas which uh, Brooks and Zaghi were able to exploit, and they made interesting connections between that and number theory, and number theory of things called Dedekind sum. So there's a nice story relating classical algebraic number theory with the geometry of the singularity, the defects due to orbital singularity. Uh, another class of examples, also coming from algebraic geometry, uh, was from Hilbert modular surfaces. These are the analogues of surfaces of Hilbert modular curves, uh, covered by the action of a discrete group on, of half plane and so on. And they have some cusps, singularity at, infin at infinity called cusps. And the question was, how do, you, uh, how do these affect the theorem for the formula that gives you the Riemann Rock theorem? How do you, what is the correction due to the singularity of the cusps? And Fritz uh, worked on this. There was some beautiful work about how to resolve the cusp and calculate. And on the basis of that, he made some general conjecture what the defects of these cusp singularities should be in higher dimension and relating it to the L functions in number theory. And this was one of the motivations that led Singer, Patodi, and I in 1973 to find a formula for a manif signature for the manifold with boundary when you assume, as I say, that the boundary, uh, the metric near the boundary is a product of a, one variable with the boundary metric. And you had to, that the answer involves the metric on the boundary, it involves a spectral invariant of the metric on the boundary, which we call the eta invariant, which has turned out to be quite productive. And this, this, this eta function invariant is very much like the number theory L function. Its value at zero is the defect, essentially the defect. So these have had a long history. The third one uh, is actually a much more elementary one. It's what I'm going to be talking about today. It could have been done a long time ago. I'm sure if Fritz was here, he would say, yes, he could have done this easily. Uh, but it, it has some little bit of a twist in it. It is the case of a, ma a real manifold with a co-dimension 2 sub-manifold. For example, it could be complex co-dimension 1 in a complex manifold. And you, we can ask for the, um, when we have metrics uh, on, on this manifold, we can have conical singularities. A conical singularity along a sub-manifold is one which in the normal direction looks like a cone instead of being flat, and moves the vertex of the cone moves along the sub-manifold in a smooth way, and in particular, the angle of the cone remains constant as you move along the sub-manifold. And um, this is theorem, generalizing the, the theorems of Hensebrook to this case is what I'm going to be talking about today, and it's quite elementary. It's really a sort of small coda, small addition to the classical theory. It's to do with branch coverings, because branch covering classically complex variable theory, you branch along the complex co-dimension one sub-variety. So, cone. So now I start on a really elementary geometry. A cone in two dimensions looks like this. You don't need me to explain. Uh, this is a cone, and it's a sharp angle here. If you cut the cone along a slit, open it up, you can fold it up on a plane. It's flat, really. And you make the cone again by gluing these two pieces together. This angle measures the sharpness of the angle of the cone. We call this angle 2 pi beta. And if beta is 1, there is no singularity. It's just flat. There is no cone. But if beta is here, and the formula for the, for the metric is that you just take the usual formula in polar coordinates, uh, and you put in a beta factor here. Uh, and then if beta is 1, you get the flat metric. If beta is greater than 1, you get this picture. And if beta is less than one, oh yeah, can I read? maybe not reading right. No, sorry, that's less than one and that's greater than one. The, the, the beta is less than one and bigger than one. Uh, but I call this positive curvature and this negative curvature, this flat curvature. Because if you take a cone and you smooth out the vertex of the cone, 
with a bit of sandpaper and keep it nice and spherical, angular rotation and symmetric, then it will be a smooth manifold with a definite curvature. And um, you can work out the curvature, total amount of curvature inside there by looking at the, going around the boundary and using the gauss bonnet theorem. And you'll see at once that the uh, first case is positive curvature, this is a negative curvature. And in the limiting case, when you go back to the vertex, what you can say is that the curvature is actually a multiple of the delta function. The metric is flat everywhere, except at the vertex. And there it has a delta function singularity, and the and the value of where we are, yes. Here is the formula for the it's the, it's the delta function times two pi times one minus delta beta. So beta is one, it's zero, it's flat, and if beta is less or greater than one, it's positive or negative multiple of the delta function. These are all very elementary and um, baby stuff in geometry, but it, it, it's somehow crucial to understand it properly. So, uh, now, the, the whole, this next part is all going to be about two dimensions, so you can relax. We all understand two dimensions of cones. Now, of course, the angle, this beta, it could have special values. It could be one over an integer. If it's one over an integer, then, of course, you can think of starting with the plane and dividing by... Oh, dear, dear, this is technology. Oh, dear, dear, what's happened here? I'm getting, I'm getting a long way there. I'm getting, now I'm getting a long way there. Yeah. One more. There we are. It moves too fast. Okay. Trouble is, I either have to cho look in front here or I have to look there and get a trick in my neck. Um, so if, if B is 1 over the integer, then the cone is got, can be thought of as just got from the R2 by dividing by a finite cyclic group. The angle is rational. And so you get just a slice of the face. And so you can understand this case very well. It corresponds just to ordinary, simplest kind of uh, branch covering where you have the. Uh, uh, Variable z replaces the variable u by z goes to power q, q to the q. And the, the, now the, the, the flat metric on, in the uh, u plane pushes down to give you the conical metric in the z plane. So you, the, the metric is just pushed down. But of course, you could think the other way around. You could take the, qu the quotient space uh, of a cyclic group, actually. It's still a plane. Uh, if you took the flat metric of that, you could pull it back to the other one. Now you'll go the other way around. Now the metric will have angle beta equals q. Uh, I mean, the remarkable fact about branch coverings is that both the space above and the space below are manifolds. It's not a singularity. The branch point is not a singularity. It's only a singularity of the map. Each of them separately is a manifold. And the, the, uh, the reverse process of going up and down just inverts the value of beta. Um, notice the comment I made at the bottom here. If you take... Quotient of C by cyclic group or Q, either in topology or in complex analysis, the uh, the invariant functions are the functions on the quotient, and so that's what why it's still a manifold. But it's not true in dif real differential geometry, where the metrics are preserved. Then you really get a cone. You see the singularity. So since in this sort of game we use both topology, complex analysis, and differential geometry, you see that you can play around between manifolds. And, and conical singularities in a, in a very interesting little way. And this is a, it's an obvious fact that the, you, when you, the holomorphic functions, which are invariant under C group, are the functions in the, in the quotient variable, but the real ones that are not. Now, going on with rational angles, I was saying if you value the cone angle beta is rational, then you can think of it as corresponding to a correspondence. You have u plane, the variable plane, Q to the Q is equal to P, both equal to, say, a complex variable Z. And then, as I said, the metric, one metric can be pushed down in one plane and lifted up to the other one. And then that'll turn the flat metric into a metric with angle for an arbitrary rational number. And in polar coordinates, like this. All this is very, very, very baby stuff. Um, and so you look at it like, like this you have a, a Q plane, a V plane, a Z plane, a W plane, and you can go this way and that way and this way and that way. It all Sorry, I apologize for being so elementary, but uh, sometimes you need to do very elementary things to prove a theorem. So 
So now they get, let me tell you the, the answer. So the top genus defect, what is it going to be if you have a, a manifold X? Well, let, let's suppose that it's complex, so everything makes sense in complex analysis. X is complex manifold. What Sigma is a co-dimension one sub-manifold. And we can define, define the um, Todd genus defect as the integral over the whole manifold of the Todd form for a smooth metric minus any smooth metric will give the same answer, the arithmetic genus, minus the integral over the what you get by removing the singularity. This is the same the integral Tn of beta. Where this is the Todd genus of a metric with a uh, conical metric with angle beta. So this is the, this is the contribution for the singular one, this is the contribution for the ordinary one, and the difference is defined to be the defect. And the question is, what is the formula for the defect? And here, here is the... Uh, there. The formula for the defect is at the bottom. Okay, it's a very nice formula. The defect is equal to, first of all, take the subspace sigma out, take its total total class, you divide it by x, x is the first term class of the normal bundle, in the brackets here, you write down our old friend, the generating function of the Todd polynomial, and here the same thing with x replaced by beta of x. The difference of these two, uh, you subtract, you evaluate the whole thing, the highest de relevant degree class of sigma, and that gives you the value of the defect. It's a very nice formula. It looks so obvious that the proof should be obvious. In fact, I could leave it as an exercise to, to the student. But in fact, it, it, there's some hidden subtleties in it. Um, by the way, just notice, of course, this function, I mean, I, I could cancel this x with these x's here, but I left it in because this is the one with power series beginning with 1. This is the one with power series beginning with 1. Now, the difference of these two, that 1 disappears, so the term 1 over x from here, the pole, has cancelled here. And therefore, this makes perfectly good sense. It's a polynomial when you expand it. The x, x is a formal two-dimensional two with a two-dimensional class here, and then you multiply this by that, and evaluate, and you get your explicit formula, and here is the explicit formula. There it is. I've plugged in the values of the, uh, put in the Bernoulli numbers, and here is the formula for the def defect, as the leading term is 1 minus beta over the Todd, gene Todd of, the, of the subspace. Notice that beta is 1, this cancels, and it vanishes again. Well, beta equals 1 appears as a factor everywhere, so all the defect terms drop out in the flat case, as we expect, as guaranteed. And these are higher, higher and higher order corrections involving higher and higher powers of x uh, multiplied by appropriate classes of the Todd polynomials to give you the right dimension to evaluate on sigma. So that is a nice, beautifully simple formula. I haven't given you the proof yet, but at least I've told you the formula. So the example, if x is dimension 4, then you get two terms. Uh, the first term is 1 minus the genus, comes from this one, and the next one is... <coughs> you get 1 minus beta squared over 12 times self-intersection of sigma with itself. Sigma, in this case, is a surface in a four-manifold uh, self-intersection number, and that comes in with 1 minus beta squared, depending on the angle, and this is the Bernoulli number. And in general, the more complicated formulas of the same kind. Okay? Now let's take a little breath. Well, let's, by the same time, write down the corresponding formula for the L genus. This time, the manifold is not necessarily complex, it's real, and we have co-dimension 2, real subspace, and, uh, well, I won't bother to write the formula down because it's almost the same as the previous formula. Because of this identity between the tangent this function, the only difference is this extra constant <coughs> term. That just corresponds to the first odd term in the Bernoulli expansion, so all the interesting parts are the same. Um, in dimension, for example, in dimension 4, if you want to calculate the signature in dimension 4, you don't get the term coming from the genus term, you only get the term coming from the uh, self-intersection. Uh, and so the, the formulas are almost the same. I could have impressed you by writing down again, but I think one impression is enough. Um, there's also a theorem I call three, theorem 3 beta, which deals with the Dirac operator. The Dirac index is, again, almost the same formula for the, as the Todd genus. If you rate, work with the Dirac index of a spin C manifold, it essentially is the same formula. And so the main parts of these things are all the same. The formula always involves that... Uh, Bernoulli number expansion. So these are all variants. And go back for the moment, remember the, there's also the oil, poor old Euler characteristic, the ordinary Euler characteristic, not the sheaf cohomology, Euler's number. 
Now, for the Euler number, uh, you can compare the formula there. There should be a corresponding formula for the, the beta. And the only correction term there is this term, the first term, 1 minus beta, the Euler number of sigma. There are no higher terms. That's because if you go back to the formulas we had before, this is the term that corresponds to the odd b b balloon number B1. So all the higher terms don't come in. So this is for the Euler class. The formula is very elementary, and you can prove it by just triangulation and do ordinary calculation of numbers of vertices and so on. But that does not work for the higher ones. There are interesting corrections, which is what the whole theory is about. But I thought you should see the Euler class. It is just the first term, the first odd Bernoulli number, that contributes the answer. Now let me go back to the history, because the first Arbeit was 1957. This was a momentous occasion, because it represented the first appearance on the scene of Grotendieck. And not only that, he lectured on the Grotendieck theorem and Rock theorem, which is this great new uh, generalization of the history of Riemann Rock theorem. I remember that there were only about six of us at the first Arbeitstagung, and Grotendieck lectured for about five hours a day every day. It was an intense uh, course in the, in the Grotendieck theory. Well, this is all done in the context of algebraic geometry, and what he was, did was to take the uh, both coherent sheaves and vector bundles. And he's a K-theory of either of these things. Um, what he used the resolutions of sheaves by vector bundles, locally free sheaves on non-singular varieties, to show the K-theory was the same whether you worked with sheaves or with vector bundles. Um, that's what I said down here. And he then also defined a proper forward map. If you have maps x to y, let's say both projective varieties, then there is a map going this way. A natural map that goes backwards when you pull back a vector bundle. So if you think in terms of sheaf theory, you push it forward, take cohomology in the right sense, and then you find that you get a map from the k of x to k of y, which Grotendi invented this symbol, f, sh f shriek. I don't know what you call it in French, but uh, or exclamation mark. Um, and if y is a point, then this reduces to the Euler carriage system. So the Grotendieck Riemann Rock theorem is a theorem which tells you something about the churn character of this direct image. And if y is a point, it reduces to the history of Riemann Rock theorem. So it's a tremendous natural generalization. Um, now, the two key things to point out about the Grotendieck image first of all, uh, it is functorial. Nothing Grotendieck did was ever non functorial, of course. He was the epitome of functoriality. So this is a functorial map, and of course functoriality hides a lot of uh, things explicitly. Second important fact was that the K theory of X times the perspective line, the two sphere, is the K theory of the tensor is the tensor product of the K theory of the two factors. And the K theory of the perspective line is just a free abelian group with two generators, one of which corresponds to the dimension, is not very interesting. The other one is the interesting one. Anyway, this is a key part of the Grotendieck machinery, uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So this is a quick summary of Grotendieck's impact. And here is the man himself in his heyday, looking very pleased with himself, very smiling. Um, and uh, some of us remember him looking like that. Um, in the first decade after the first Arbeitstag, many things happened. Now, the first thing I point out is in the same year as the first Arbeitstag, we had bot periodicity. The bot periodicity theorem came from a different world. It came from not algebraic geometry, it came from homotopy theory, which is about the homotopy theory of new groups, and the unexpected result of the groups were periodic. And this is approved by Morse theory. So this is a tremendous achievement in a totally different field, the theory, homotopy theory. But uh, it happened in the same year that Gutenberg brought this theory, and because all these things were discussed in the Arbeitsagens, it became pretty clear Fritz and me, after a few years, that these two theories should be combined together and that we should develop a topological K-theory, which is based on the bot periodicity theorem. Uh, and then this led on to the index theorem, which I mentioned, equivariant index theorem, which group depending on the equivariant K-theory, which my student Graham Siegel developed. And the key point for topological K-theory is that the bot periodicity theorem is essentially equivalent to this statement here, the K-theory of the product of x times the two sphere is the tensor product of the k theory of x with the k theory of the two. And here, these are topological k theories, but the theorem is exactly the same as in algebraic geometry. And in fact, you can produce a theorem, proof of the theorem, 
which mimics the outer brain geometry almost precisely. So it's not an accident. It's very fundamental that bot periodicity corresponds to fundamental facts in Grotendieck theory. And you can see it even more clearly in the line below. If you work with equivariant K theory, where G is a circle acting on the mm. complex line of length, uh, by, as a phase factor, then you can talk about the equivariant K theory of C. And C is not compact, so you should put the equivariant K theory with complex supports. And then that, the bot periodicity theorem can be entirely formulated as saying that the equivariant K theory of C is the same with the equivariant K theory of a point. The equivariant K theory of a point is more of a, almost by definition the representation ring of the group, and it's, it's the finite Laurent series in variable eta and eta inverse, eta corresponding to the basic one dimensional representation. This is, if you like, Fourier series, um, where D is a circle. This, this formulation of bot periodicity is equivalent to his theorem, and it, it, it makes it much more clearly its connection is with, uh, with Grotendieck theory, as I will see in a moment. So it's rather remarkable that in 1957, both the bot periodicity theorem and Grotendieck theory emerged, and that in their, in their heart it would be the same theorem, same statement. And this was then exploited. <coughs> so here is Bott, the grandfather of the subject, and a nice picture showing what a nice man he was, one of my oldest friends, and a really great man. Now, the, if you want to see the relationship between the Bott periodicity theorem and K theory, you should go back to first principles, right to the beginning. Remember your childhood, the first time you learned about polynomial rings and ideals and things like that. So here is the variable Z. Okay. Here is the ring of holomorphic or functions or polynomials, if you prefer. Here is the... Somebody should switch off their mobile phone. Ah, thank you. So this exact sequence, this is A is the origin. So this is the functions on the origin of constants. This is just the ring functions divided by the ideal uh, and generated by Z, and the quotient is the constant, written as an exact sequence of sheaves, where you think of this as the ring of functions on the, either on C or on the effective line, and this is the ring of um, section of the line bundle, or if you want to do it on C, you can even think of it as forgetting about the point of infinity, but working with graded things. So everything has a weight given by the action of the circle. So this is the weight minus 1, Z has weight plus 1, so you map it like that. So you view this exact sequence as equivalently to the action of the circle in K theory, or either in Grotendieck or in Bott. And what this says is precisely that the K, K theory, of, equivalent K theory of a point, is mapped to the equivalent K theory of C with compact supports, uh, and that the map takes element one to the one element one minus eta inverse. The one minus eta inverse is, of course, just this one minus that one. So uh, that, that is the net most compact way of expressing bot periodicity and its relationship with the Grotendieck theory. And it's a, it's a triviality. It's just how go back to the, what, the very first thing you learned about polynomial rings with one variable and the ideals. Now, next thing is localization. Um, this is something you've learned from algebra, from commutative algebra. I very famously wrote an Ian MacDonald textbook on, on commutative algebra, uh, which I learned my commutative algebra from, indirectly from Grotendieck, and then I wrote this little textbook, which made me famous. If I go to parts of the world uh, where there are a lot of students, they come forward to ask me to autograph this book on commutative algebra. I'm regarded as the world authority in commutative algebra, uh, <laughs> which I certainly was not. Anyway, um, so if you learn, one of the things you learn in commutative algebra is the notion of localization. And the most drastic localization is to go from a ring to its field of functions. So you can replace the finite Laurent series in the integer coefficients, first with rational coefficients, and, co and then you go to the field of rational functions with co one complex variable. And so if you're working with localization, then, it, uh, then the compact support condition can be ignored, and the number one, the trivial bundle on C, it doesn't have compact supports, of course. But nevertheless, you can forget that when you localize. So you can ask, what is its inverse under the map? Grotendieck map is going to a point. And the inverse is, of course, the divide by what we had before. It's 1 over 1 minus e to the minus 1. If you take the churn character of that in equivariant cohomology, you get, of course, the generating function for the third class, the balloon number. This is where it all comes from. There's no x factor here. It comes in later. 
But basically, this is the yeah, this is where it all comes. It all comes from this formula here. But obviously, because of this pole, you have to deal with that pole in some way or other. And if, you know, if you're a physicist, you know how to deal with infinities. One well, various ways to deal with infinities. One is you think of some fancy way in which the infinity makes sense, or easier way is you subtract two infinities. So let's do, do the easy way. Canceling the pole. Suppose you consider the uh, Q-fold branch covering the plane. Um, then in that, there are these two terms. Look into this term here, and the same term with the Q inserted. These are both parts here beginning with one, which gives rise to the pole when you multiply by the one over x outside. So these, this difference of these two has to cancel the pole. This thing makes sense. The power series in x. This is the thing that appears in the formula for the theorem one I gave before. And that works for one, one over an integer by shifting around between p's and q's and using the correspondence. You do it for rational numbers. And then by continuity, you get it for all numbers beta. So this is the way this expression appears in that theorem. All very elementary, very trivial, and with no calculation. Now. That's, that, that's a these are calculations all done in the space of one complex variable, but remembering the action of the circle. Nothing else. It's a local uh, piece of algebra analysis, whatever you like. But now, if you want to go back to prove the theorem, which I stated, here is the outline of the proof. Uh, first of all, you notice that the difference between the two integrals can be localized to a neighborhood of the subspace, because you can choose the metrics to be the same far away. They only look conical near sigma. Um, so then the integral is localized near sigma. In particular, it now acquires u1 symmetry in the direction normal to the submanifold. So that means you can start talking about the calculation, calculation with respect to u1. And so the, what we did before was a universal calculation for u1 acting on c. And uh, if you also use the not only the equivariant cohomology, but the equivariant differential forms, the sort of Vey algebra, then you get a basic two form corresponding to x, which represents the first churn class locally. And the, real, the calculation was all sketched about. So then, essentially, this is the end of the proof. It's one modulo, little details you put together. Well, I'm slightly cheating, but not, not too much, not too much. Um, I hear it Ve as a young man. No, nobody knew, none of you knew him at that age. I don't, even I didn't know him at that age, but he was a young man once. And uh, that, that's what he looked like. You can see he's quite a sharp guy. Um, further comments. Um, when I was working on this question, uh, Don Zaghi talked me about some thing that occurs in number theory called the distribution property uh, for functions on a circle. And it, it turned out to be very helpful for me. Um, the for functions on a circle, the distribution property says this. For every integer q, average over the finite cyclic group of order q, translate by the group element over all the group elements, divide by q, this is the average. And the answer is this should be the same. This is the property of the function as the value of the function on z to the q. Uh, so this, if a function has this property, he says the distribution property. Um, you can apply it to different classes of functions. And in number theory, there's a generalization where you take different, instead of putting 1 over q, you put 1 over q to the power here. But even this simple formula is enough for me. And it's, e it's easy to check that this formula holds for these three functions. 1 over 1 minus z to the minus 1, the generating function for the pol polynomials, the same thing was then replaced by z inverse, and the constant function 1, which obviously has this property. Um, and these are, if you work in the space of Schwarz distributions on the circle, those are the things which can be expanded in uh, doubly infinite Fourier series, in which the coefficients are polynomial growth, then in the class of these functions, it's trivial to check that these are the only three functions that satisfy this distribution property. The word distribution here has two quite different meanings. Fortunately, they coincide. Um, so the, 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 these three functions and their linear combinations <coughs> are the only functions with this property. Um, and that turns out hidden in the... It, 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 if you ask what the relation this has to the theorem that I talked about in this proof, it answer it's hidden. It's, it's the equivalent to the functoriality of the Grotendieck direct image for finite coverings, and somehow that's uh, on this side. And it, it, but that, I don't need it to use it, but I'm pointing out to it that it is this property. Um, now, the three functions in here, these three functions, correspond essentially, uh, down by point 0.4 here, they correspond essentially to the Todd genus, the L genus, and the Euler characteristic. The Euler characteristic comes from the function 1, a very trivial one. 
This is the one that gives the Todd genus. And the difference of these two gives the L genus. <coughs> By the way, notice these E functions, as rational functions, are linearly dependent. That's the relationship between tan checks and sine checks. <coughs> but as distributions, they're not independent. Because their sum of appropriate coefficients is the delta function. Uh, some further comments. <coughs> All right, that was what I did. Um, we can extend these theorems not just to the, the genus I've talked about so far, but also to what Hitzelberg called the chi y genus, which is where you take the sheaves of differential forms, uh, algebraic variety, you take the p, p forms, you multiply by indeterminate y to the p, you sum, so the fun this is a polynomial in p, this is we call the chi y genus. It, the special values of y, <coughs> you recover the other ones. For y equals uh, plus one or minus one, you get the Euler characteristic and the Todd class and so on. So this is a very useful way of doing them all, and it really, what it really means is you've taken the three basic functions I talked about, and you take linear combinations with an indeterminate parameter y, and you get to this formula. Um, now, the second point I made is that these distributional characters, the things that I mentioned, uh, Laurent series in Z with polynomial growth and the coefficients, they occur in index theory in general, for elements, operators are not elliptic, but are elliptic transversal to a group action. And in the case of the circle, the group acting on, on, on C, uh, that simply means they're transversal um, to the orbits, the circle, and uh, this um, point of view corresponds precisely to looking at the function on the circle as gridded by the action of the circle. It's nothing more than that. So when you think of them as gridded, and you can write down one, one over x term, which ha that makes perfectly good sense. But that, that gives sense to the divergent pole in this theory, if you want. Um, the limiting case, by the way, of beta equals to zero, I didn't mention, but the, the cone, if you take beta equals to zero, uh, then that means the cone, or the manifold actually goes off to infinity, it becomes non-compact. And there are interesting examples of manifolds with, which are not compact, and at infinity, the, the surface appears, and that corresponds to the limiting case beta equal to zero. And the theorem with appropriate exact statement still applies. You still have the same formulas, but now you put beta equal to zero. Now, since that was the talk I gave in Bonn, now I had given you the talk I prepared in the train coming from Bonn. Uh, well, more or less. First of all, uh, are there other proofs of this theory? And I'm sure there are. The one other proof would be the kind that Jean Michel would like here. But it would be to use the uh, Tia Padodi Singer boundary value problem for signature of manifold with boundary, which is eta invariant turned up. And then he, he and uh, also based on the work of Witten, studied the adiabatic limit of the eta invariant as the circle shrinks. And that way you should get formulas that relate uh, things outside to the thinking. Such. There is one problem, though, that, that you, you, that way you seem to get a circle a cylinder going to infinity with angle zero, and what we want to get is a cone with angle beta. So there's some change has to take place to get to the angle of the cone, other than just the limiting value. But I'm sure that's exercise that I can leave to you over coffee. Uh, that's the f first uh, observation. Um, then we come to generalizations. This problem is so simple that you should be able to generalize it in some interesting way. Well, obviously, you can take a manifold with several sub-manifolds of co-dimension uh, two, and you can take cones based on these with even different values of the angles on each one. And uh, it's obviously fairly clear that you could generalize that formula for the um, integral of the Todd class or the L class to cover these kind of things. But you could be more drastic. Uh, after all, singular metric, uh, conical singularity is a very special kind of one, even if you only allow a finite number of transversal sub-manifolds. But nothing can stop you forming linear com convex combinations of metrics. They will still be metrics of some kind, with singularities. And there's no reason why that finite co that combination should be finite. You could take an, an integral, an average, of overall co-dimension two sub-manifolds, and you get some kind of limiting metric. But in principle, this theorem should still work, because the answer you're trying to give is a log by an integral. It should be the average of all those integrals. So I think there should be some theorem that uh, works for all the general class of metrics, which is much more general than what I've been talking about. And you question, is there a general useful formula 
some large class of metrics which you have to specify, and it should include, this is the interesting thing, a polyhedral formula, because a polyhedral, polyhedron is a case where the metric is flat in, on the polyhedra, but has bends and the angles and so on, and that will be a combinatorial formula. And a combinatorial formula for the signature has long been sought. And Gelfand and McPherson worked on this for a long time. They got, I think, a useful formula in dimension of four, which involves the combinatorics and also the angles. And when you have a combinatorial manifold thought of as metric, it doesn't just have a combinatorial structure, it has um, angles between the vertices and its edges, uh, parameters. And they gave a formula in dimension four, which I think is quite useful, uh, the contributions from the points, I think. And, uh, and also, of course, the classical Euler formula for Euler characteristic is an example where we know uh, a combinatorial formula. So the question is, is there a class of matrix which interpolates between the simple quantum I've been talking about here and polyhedral ones, which will give you a useful formula throughout this whole family and reproduce what Gelfand and Fersen have done and perhaps do more? I leave that, again, exercise for the audience challenge. I mean, uh, can we give a talk? I've gone back over the past, but I should give you some possibilities for the future. And another question, in all that I was doing, this angle beta, the cone, was fixed at fixed angle. As you moved along the subspace, sigma, the cones had, were all cones with the same angle. That was very important because eventually that's how I localized the problem, uh, and I couldn't done it, done it with a variable beta. So the methods <laughs> certainly don't generalize to beta. But the formulas, you know, beta is a real variable. You could, the same formula I wrote down would make sense if beta was a function. That probably doesn't give the right answer. It may be correction terms involving higher derivatives of, of a variable beta. But again, I think there must be a formula. I leave it exercise for the bright people in the audience to, to find. <coughs> then we get generalization of a different kind, generalized K-theory. Well, the very first thing you see when you start to play with these formulas I've been doing, is that a cone along some manifold looks very much like a line bundle. And the formulas which they, in which they contribute, the, the beta x is like the first churn class of a line bundle, but it has a coefficient beta in front, which is a real number. So, these, so the idea is that a bundle of cones is really a generalization of a line bundle. Instead of being, OK, the, the cone is really flat space in the sky, but you're given in the metric which gives it an angle. And so it's a really a flat bundle together with a parameter. <coughs> but you think of it as, as giving you a, a cone. So this gives you line bundles. And once you've got line bundles, we know that's the basis of all K-theory. You can form direct sums of line bundles to get vector bundles, but they can have different values of beta, probably. And then you can take a splitting principle, and then you can get into K-theory, and so on. So you should expect to gener get a, a generalized K-theory built on the cone as replacing a, the notion of a lot ordinary flat two-dimensional complex space. Uh, now, that thing will have the property that the real numbers will be all through that. So the churn class will not be an integer class. It will be a real, real class. Well, we know that in real differential geometry, uh, of course, churn classes are real. In line, in line bundles, they're integers. But here we get an intermediate category, which look like line bundles, but they are in, non integral parameter. Well, another case where we know this thing happens is in the K-theory of von Neumann algebras of type 2. Von Neumann algebras, by von Neumann, if you know the type 1 algebras have dimensions given by integers, type 2 algebras have dimensions given by real numbers. Then there's type 3, which is even worse. Uh, and if for the type 2 algebras, you can develop K-theory, and that K-theory essentially is the same as ordinary K-theory tends to the reals, which is isomorphic to real cohomology. So you can do this. Uh, there is a such a theory. Um, and in fact, thinking about it uh, after breakfast this morning and the few minutes I had before the lecture, I think I see the sort of link. You see, if you take a, uh, the famous construction of the Neumann algebras or the group measure construction, if you take a space, measure space, it's compact measure space for, with a uh, action of its discrete group, then you take the um, uh, group algebra of the group and you add, twist it with the functions on the measure space but incorporating the action and you get typical examples of von Neumann algebras. The simplest case of which you take the circle and the rotation. 
If the rotation is irrational, you get it for Neumann algebraic in fact, uh, irreducible, I mean, uh, like an irreducible one. So those kind of Neumann algebras circle with a, with a rotation is precisely what is a von Neumann algebra. So I think these bundles of cones, they look very geometrical, because we're thinking of them geometrically, but if you replace them by the language of linear analysis, then that is a line bundle in the theory of this von Neumann algebra, K-theory. I mean, there the K-theory we know exists. So therefore the K-theory I was speculating about five minutes ago will exist. It'll be the same as this K-theory. Uh, but you get a different point of view of what a bundle of von Neumann algebra sounds a very abstract thing. Right? Unless you're a von Neumann algebra expert, you run away if it, as soon as you see it. But a bundle of cones for a geometer is very friendly. So if, the, if these two things, in this case, are really the same, it could be very useful to think of the interplay between one and the other, because the von Neumann algebra gives you a beginning of a direct link to linear analysis and K-theory and index theorems and so on, and over the real numbers. And that, unless you did this, you wouldn't need to go through what I did before, work with rational numbers and go to a limit. You just do directly with the real variable. Everything would make sense in this fancy language, um, and you'd have to think even less, except that the, underneath it, there would be the st structure of the von Neumann algebras, which is where the K-theory is built. But um, whether it's worthwhile is another matter, but it could be some payoff. Uh, it isn't, it's the furthest extreme from what I was trying to do, which is to be very elementary. But sometimes it pays to jump from being very elementary to being very sophisticated. And here is a case where you can try to have both, uh, you have your cake and eat it. And the last question I have uh, is, uh, does this have a relationship with non-cumulative geometry? Well, you know, it's the kind of question you can always ask at the end of every lecture. Uh, and uh, again, because von, von Neumann algebra was part of Cohn's work, he moved from them into C star algebras and into differential algebras. And so non-cumulative differential geometry is very close to this subject. So if you want to relate the von Neumann algebra side to the differential geometry side that goes with characteristic classes and cones, then I think the non-cumulative geometry provides a very natural framework and language. So again, it's a very sophisticated machinery, but a baby, baby problem. No, but it could be um, useful. It could suggest generalizations. It could help to answer some of the other questions. And at least it'd be amusing. Well, I think I'll stop there. Thank you.